the quicker okay. and next. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Noah Silverman, and I want to talk to you a bit today about data science and what that really means and often how it's misused and uh, misinterpreted in our exciting startup environment. People seem to get too obsessed with being trendy and cool with the latest concepts of data, but not really understanding the science behind it. I have a PhD in statistics and machine learning, and at Helios we specialize in developing bespoke artificial intelligence solutions for clients across a broad range of industries, so that gives us real experience and insight into what companies are doing that works and what companies are doing that doesn't work. So really, all of data science and artificial intelligence and machine learning is understanding uncertainty. If we're certain, if we know the answer, you don't need any fancy math. You don't need any fancy software. It's very simple stuff. But unfortunately, the world is not that simple, so we spend all of our time learning and modeling uncertainty. Now, there's an old joke that there's lies, big lies, and then statistics. And then I always like to add self-serving use of statistics because you can misinterpret this in any way you want to make whatever argument or case you want or make your product sound sexy or make the marketing good. And I see this kind of stuff misused all the time. And as an old joke or new joke I heard recently, uh, a big data expert, a deep learning expert, and a blockchain expert walk into a bar. What happens? Well, Facebook buys the bar for a few billion. And sadly, every VC I've talked to and every angel investor I've talked to tell me that 99% of the startups they see now have a slide somewhere in their presentation that has probably two of these three terms on it. Even if they don't know what they're doing and even if they don't know what it's used for, if you put this on your slide, you'll probably get funded. And that's a problem. People have gotten so obsessed with the tools and so obsessed with the trendiness that they've forgotten the science half of data science. So this, if you haven't seen it, is a, a classic model of the scientific process. Make some observation, look at your data, graph it, study it, think of some interesting questions, formulate a hypothesis, test your hypothesis, analyze the test, refine or reject things, loop it over and over again until you have something that makes sense and is defensible. So if your product is a smart alarm clock or a virtual assistant or robotics or anything else, it's not about throwing a big pile of data into the latest toolkit from Google. It's really understanding what you're learning and what you're doing. Now, I picked this slide on purpose because it's wrong. And really, what you're doing in all of this is backwards. If you're good at data science, what you want to do is study where it's wrong, study the wrongness of the model, study where it doesn't fit, study where it doesn't work. For example, a client was, was uh, analyzing digital advertising and found that they had a nice model that fit, but it was really wrong sometimes. And we took a look and realized, hey, on the weekends, people click your ads, but they don't buy things because they're not at work. So your model's wrong there. Okay, well, we learned something. Now we can adjust the model and be less wrong. And that's really what this is, is a game of constantly refining, going through that scientific process so that you're less wrong. Unfortunately, as humans, what we do is we look for confirmation. We look for all the things to justify why we're right and why our model is brilliant. And my mom told me I'm a genius and all my friends think it's great. The problem is we wind up fooling ourselves. And if you dig deep enough in the data, you can always prove yourself right. So I like the opposite approach. If I see something that looks like it's working, I stop and think, wait, where is it wrong? Where can I break it? Where can I find something where it's not working? Because that tells me where I need to dig in and do more work. Now, Mark Twain brilliantly said, it's not what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure. And it's exactly what happens with all these statistical models. Again, if you're using some deep learning toolkit from Google or Facebook or open source software package, and you throw the data in and you get a green light and it says the model's good, that's dangerous because you don't know where you're wrong. So when we model things, we like to think the world looks like this. You get three red dots of data, you can draw a nice line, and you woohoo, I have a model, I could model where the next dot will be, life is nice and easy. Unfortunately, data looks like this in the real world and often it looks like this. Now, you can draw that blue line, and in fancy mathematical terms, that line is known as blue, which is the best linear, unbiased estimator. And you have a model, and it's correct. But if you actually look at it, it's wrong a lot. It's not very good. 
So you, again, want to understand where your mathematical models are wrong. Another, my uh, clicker, oh, here it is. Okay, this is an example of the wrongness. Each of those red dots, I've drawn a line to show where the model's wrong. And then you'd want to plot this and study it and, and try and analyze, again, where the model's not fitting and what else can you learn. Here's an example. I just want to jump to classification where, and this is what's popular in image recognition, uh, the new Google model that can recognize pictures of cats or Facebook can identify your friend's face in a photo. It uses a classification. And in this case, there's red, blue, and green. And you can see in a few spots, the model's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong here. And that's okay. But you at least want to be aware. Now what happens, let's say we have three photos. For the cat, we're 80% sure it's a cat. For the dog, we're 70% sure it's a dog. For the bear, we're only 50% sure it's a bear, based on this model. So what do you do? What do you tell your user? Do you say it's a bear? Well, maybe, but it's wrong at least half the time. So you need to take that into account in your product, whether it's something internal you're doing for robotics or whether it's a report you're displaying on a web page. You need to think about how do you present that data to your user, and again, how do you represent the uncertainty? If you'll notice here, these are all probabilities. And all machine learning models will give you probabilities somewhere inside. Sadly, a lot of them don't show you the probability. They just give you the answer. And the answer is often just the choice with the highest probability. But in the case of the bear, it's still wrong half the time. So getting a little deeper and recognizing probabilities and then making smart, informed decisions based on the probabilities. And maybe you look at costs. What's the cost if I'm wrong? What's the benefit if I'm right? What's the probability of this photo? And you make an informed choice based on the cost and benefit of which way you make a decision. Now, I like this photo because there's one dog in here, but I guarantee you any machine learning algorithm is going to get that wrong. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate. Or even worse, what happens if the next photo comes up and looks like this? What does your model do? Whatever it classifies it at is going to be wrong. But again, you need to account for that. You need to understand that and you need to represent that in the world. So there's an old saying in statistics, which is if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess. If you give me 100 variables and want me to model the probability of a customer buying something, I can find a way to mix and match that data and take the logarithm of this one and the square root of that one and scale the other one. I can probably make it prove anything you want. You tell me what you want the answer to be, and I can juggle it, and it will be mathematically correct. And that's okay if I'm doing that on purpose to illustrate a point. What's dangerous is when you have somebody with a six month data science certificate who doesn't realize that's what they're doing. They've gone and turned the crank and come up with a model and they don't realize that it's overfit or that there's so much data that you can find anything out of it. Um, that's gonna lead me to the next topic, which is deep learning. I'm sure you've all heard of deep learning. It's the hot new thing. Uh, I'm actually not a fan. Deep learning, there's an old saying, if, every, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Deep learning, if you have pixels and you want to model something in computer vision, is incredible. It is groundbreaking. It's what's leading the revolution in self-driving cars. It's doing speech recognition in Siri, it, everything. So for that specific problem, it's great. The problem is everybody's now throwing everything they can in deep learning, and there's one big side effect or the way it works that causes a problem. It's uninterpretable. If a traditional statistical model, let's say we're looking at medicine, I can model a patient disease or reaction to a medicine, and the doctor can come and say, hey, if the patient's cortisol lowers by 10 points, what will that do to our treatment? What will it do to patients? How many more people will get sick or healthy? And you can give them an answer because you know the impact of things in the model and the relationships. Deep learning, by definition, there is no relationship. You can't tell how significant any of your inputs are or how any of the inputs relate together, if they move together, correlated, uncorrelated. It's just this huge tangled black box. Which again, if you're looking at photos and it's just a bunch of pixels, that's great. But in a lot of real world applications where you actually want to understand the process and what's happening, this doesn't help. So. I see more and more people jumping on the deep learning bandwagon. You can now do 
online courses from Stanford and deep learning. And just like music or clothing, uh, machine learning goes through trends. This is super trendy and it's very good, but only in a very, very specific niche. So I would caution you strongly about jumping onto the deep learning bandwagon unless you can make a very, very strong case why you have to have it. Now, another nice example of overfitting is Google Flu. How many of you heard of this? I don't know if it made the news in Hong Kong. A couple years ago, Google announced, hey, we can predict where the next flu outbreak will happen based on what people are searching. And that was exciting and it made all the news and it was a, a, a very cool thing. Unfortunately, after a couple years of this and looking at the real data, it turns out Google was very, very wrong. It didn't predict much of anything. And the problem here is they had about 50 variables or 50 dimensions of the data. And just like I mentioned earlier, they were just overfitting everything and finding all these weird mixes and transformations to justify their results. But it turns out it didn't actually predict very well at all. It didn't work. So it was uh, rather embarrassing for Google. So that leads me to the next topic, which is what I call tool fetish. I can't tell you how many startups and how many tech companies, when you ask them what they're doing, or I ask them, what's the mathematics, what kind of modeling you're doing, what kind of artificial intelligence have you created, and they tell me about the tools. As a comparison, if, I'm an, if an architect comes and wants to build you a, your beautiful dream house, and you say, well, tell me about it. He says, well, we have this brand power saw, and I've got this jackhammer, and this drill over here is fantastic for drilling holes. You say, yeah, but that doesn't tell me. I don't care what tools are. What's the house? What did you design? Unfortunately, again, most people are obsessed with the tools because they don't understand the underlying process or how things should be built. So I would caution you that if you see startups and you see ventures, and all they talk about are the tools, something's wrong. What that means is the people developing this don't really understand the process. Uh, and back to deep learning, yes, I'm going to pick on it a bit. It's a very sexy tool, and everyone talks about our startup. We integrate deep learning. We built a deep learning home automation. Who cares what the tool is? Tell me about the scientific method, the data, the observations, the hypothesis, what you're able to prove, what uncertainty did you quantify, what your error ranges are. That's more interesting. Not we use TensorFlow, which doesn't tell me anything. I, I like to think a lot of this data science now is turned into microwave cooking. You have Michelin starred chefs, you have microwave cooking. Anybody now can download um, Scikit-Learn, which is a Python library, or TensorFlow, which is Google's deep learning library of a couple others. You can throw your data in it, play with, adjust a few settings and get out some results, and you're now a machine learning expert or a data scientist. Unfortunately, that's just not true. And those people are setting themselves up to fail for all the reasons and things we, we discussed earlier. So I'm very cautious of microwave chefs. That's the equivalent of somebody saying, well, I can take the chicken from this microwave dish and I take the sauce packet I got from my takeaway last week and I add this other frozen thing I got from the market and I mix them all together and microwave it. I'm a chef. Uh, maybe. So I, I would caution you against this. Is a cliche we say again in this world is take some data, sprinkle some fairy dust, brag about it through your public relations, and all of a sudden you're an AI company and you're doing machine learning. But again, not really. So briefly, let's look at how you should do this. It's about analytical thinking. It's not about throwing stuff into a toolkit. So really what you want to do is you want to explain something, you want to discover a relationship, you want to learn causality, what's causing what, and that leads you to analytical design. How do you build your product? How do you build the user interface? How do you collect your data so that you can do this? And this is how you should approach the problem, not we have a bunch of data, we threw it into TensorFlow. So a brief side example, someone I know wants to start uh, an investment fund using machine learning. Reasonable, lots of hedge funds do it. And their answer is, we'll just take all the stock prices from the last week, throw it into deep learning, and we'll let it just tell us what the stock price will be tomorrow. Well, what about relationships? What about industries? What about markets? What about demand and volume and news and quarterly earning report? Oh, no, 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 we don't need any of that. Deep learning will just figure it all out. I guarantee they're going to lose money. That's not how you use this stuff. So briefly, my process, when I do this for myself or a client, is I always start with a question. What's the hypothesis? What are we trying to answer? Um, should, we, you know, should we show the ad to the customer? 
should the automatic digital thermostat turn on the air conditioning? Should the uh, self-driving car step on the brakes? What are you trying, what's the question? What are you trying to do? And then I look, well, what data do we have from our existing system? And what data do we want? Can we get more data? How expensive, how complicated, how much will it help? What's the cost benefit trade-off? So we look at data we have and data we want, and then you propose a model. I think this type of statistical model with these inputs will explain it, and maybe it does and maybe it doesn't, but let's fit that model and let's test it. And then we see, well, where is the model wrong? Is it so wrong we throw it out? Do we make adjustments for days of the week or male versus female or distance from the camera or whatever it is and rerun this and, until we come up with something that's good enough. But again, we always understand the errors and we can always make decisions based on that. So just to wrap up, I really want to emphasize the importance of critical thinking, which again seems to have gotten lost in all of this startup excitement and, and fervor to just build the next cool thing. Right? Analyze, infer, evaluate, interpret, generate ideas, reason. I always like to think of it if you're in a court of law and there's a judge sitting there and you need to prove your case with the facts and with the evidence, can you do that with your data science? Can you do that with your statistical model? If you can't, you need to go back to the computer and redo that. You want to be able to explain and justify every step of the way like you were doing it with a lawyer. And that will then give you something you can count on for business and something that's reliable. So thank you. My name is Noah Silverman and uh, we have Helios.a as a consulting firm. So any questions or feedback, uh, I'm available. So any questions? So thank you, Noah.